soil life is at the root of any other life. Um, so far on our human community journey, we have tried um, chemical agriculture and well, today we know there is a massive, massive, mass, there are massive consequences on uh, humans, but also insects and microbial life, uh, health, water, ecosystem services. We've understood that our practices are not correct if we want to make it longer on this planet. So my name is Renald Flores, um, the CEO of Fluorescent System. Um, I have created this company in 2017, which he's a natural emergence from Dr. Elaine Ingham um, Soil Food Web School. Um, today we're going to talk uh, about this soil regeneration program. We are um, we have our headquarters in Geneva, Switzerland. However, most of our operations are uh, at our clients' fields. So the key to this, uh, the key, the, the title of our study today is the key to your soil health. And for us, um, the key is soil microbiology. Yes, that soil microbiology. Um, this being said, we have to also uh, replace it in a context where chemical agriculture has infiltrated uh, universities, politics, market, uh, farmers, et cetera, et cetera. And um, very little people know about what are we talking about when we talk about soil health. And for us, soil health is soil microbiology. So, yeah, we have no more time to waste. Uh, absolutely no more time to waste. Continuing on, um, we're going to cover a few topics here, such as who we are, uh, what has made us uh, do what we do today, um, the science behind um, the core of our business, and how did we apply this science uh, on actually regenerating land, and at the end of this presentation, the results. Right. Um, our essence. Pretty little fun story here. Um, we're going to do a little 10 seconds game where I'm going to show you a few pictures and you guys may try to think what I was doing before doing the soil regeneration duty. Well, once upon a time, I was wearing these kind of items, wearing these kind of shoes, having these kind of outfit, but also having my days facing some screens, right? And... Uh, well, the end line was basically this kind of stuff. For me, it was just too much of a schizophrenic thing. I was passionate about agriculture. I mean, not agriculture, but ecology in its whole. Um, and I decided to leave. Took my backpack to understand, uh, go around the world during some years to visit and see with my eyes what were the best regenerative practices around the world. So I started with um, this realization that we need to regenerate first. Why? Because we cannot sustain things if uh, we have not regenerated it because we have depleted everything so much. So that's the first step. On that road, I uh, studied permaculture, got some certification, did some design, and also um, met the cyber people, got some training, become accredited professional, and um, all on that road, well, worked in Mexico, worked in uh, Sweden, worked in Turkey, applying the Saver Institute principles. But the key, the, the key to my trajectory has been um, meeting with the, the Dr. Elaine Ingham Soil Food Web School, which has enabling me to um, start to tackle what was most needed when I first starting to realize that we've created a mess. This being said, um, on our journey, we figured and we got shocked by a few things and that helped us to formulate what we want to do. 
And it has to see with these two pictures. You can see these two people, they are two different people. They're both wearing a mask gas and they're both protecting themselves from a very nasty product. Yes, the first one is a military, right? So not to mention anything about the color of the gas around it, looking like orange. And uh, the other one is a farmer who's actually filling up his, 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 his uh, sprayer and then on its way to spread all his field with those products. So it's very concerning if you think that this is the way we do agriculture. The guys who are performing this agriculture has to protect themselves from the same product they use to make the plant grow. Well, um, we can also think, well, it's dangerous for human. Wouldn't that be dangerous for any kind of life? Yes. So uh, in order to prevent that, we decided, we felt that was so much needed to help those farmers transition. And this has been a something that we started early um, 2017 when we kind of formulated an offer of uh, supporting the farmers um, to transition their whole system, right? Um, from chemical to uh, organic. Well, while doing this, uh, using all the science, having had that through the soil food web school, um, to the farmers so they could understand what we're doing and also trying to apply um, pragmatic methodology so they can figure things out away from the chemical. Yes, we are also tra in training them in uh, all those regenerative skills, such as understanding how the soil food web functions, in other words, the soil microbiology, but also doing uh, microbiologically loaded compost and then doing some compost extract, compost C, and making sure operationally this whole lands correctly on their fields. Regenerating for us is about bringing the soil microbiology back to the soil. So today we're working in uh, Europe mostly. Um, the main project we have is in Latvia, a 60 hectare um, trial out of 5,000 hectares. This is large scale agriculture, but we're also doing the same in France and in Austria. Um, working on main crops, um, which is staple crops, but also having some project now being developed in, in Africa, Greece and Pakistan, but as the title says, it is being developed. Yes, we are offering transition solutions to the farmer when we come and figure out, is your soil having any beneficial microbiology? We take a look, uh, figure out, and if not, we, we help the farmer create the corresponding compost that will have in its own the missing microbiology that your crop needs. Yes, these microbiology is at the root of plant health and plant protection uh, and yields. This is what we do. So while we do those composts as well, we make sure this compost lands back in the field, it's going to bring what's needed, but also we will set the farmer up with what we call compost brewer, where we will um, extract the actual compost microbiology. Then we will feed it and multiply it. So then when we're ready, when we have achieved the levels that we need, we transfer it to their tools, big sprayers, and then we bring it back to their field. So it's a pretty challenging operation. However, we start to see to start to have very good results. On the top of that, we also use uh, modern techniques such as direct seeding, which contributes to stop disturbing the soil, hence stop destroying the microbiology. And there we go, uh, establish crops and cover crops while regenerating using soil microbiology. So coming to that, we had some insights that helped us um, sharpen our actual regeneration uh, offer. And um, I'm gonna take you to a few of those insights so we understand, uh, you understand how we get where we are. About this trial, the first year, the first season, we reached 72% increase on average on market garden crops, right? That's the fundamental, that's a key 
uh, in this idea of how do we make our agricultural system produce and produce as much or more as we need for feeding the planet. Yeah, but we're gonna come back to those results a little later. Now we're gonna focus on the, the fact, the insights that drove us where we are. Conventional agriculture um, has caused many things. And one of those is, yes, stripping the soil way too much, damaging the whole microbiology. And we're gonna have a look at that later. Today, most farmers are depending on synthetic uh, fertilizers and, and phytosanitary products for the just very simple reason that they have been trained like that. Um, the big chemical companies has made sure that most universities were actually really stamping really hard all the student materials so they can learn how to do things with what product and most importantly, who to buy the product from when they would start their, their farming um, career. So also a downstream consequence has been, yes, uh, disturbing natural processes and disturbing fundamental ecosystem services such as clean water. And of course, uh, as of today, um, microbiological um, stability, right? Way less biodiversity in terms of forest plants, et cetera, bugs, et cetera. Well then, well, you're setting up the scene for other types of microbes and viruses to come up. But this is another topic. We're gonna to continue on the inside here. So um, understanding what was the root cause e, e, has been key. And, and I got to some sort of conclusion that plowing and mostly over plowing was the reason. And we're gonna, I'm gonna take you through a sort of a once upon a time story to understand how plowing made what we experience today, but also how it all started. So yes, once upon a time, planet Earth was filled with trees and rivers and a lot of animals and bugs and the diversity of many different things. Some other place would see savannas and human beings were nomads. Being nomad at that level means from a, a biological perspective, that means that those nomads were having a very limited um, pressure or impact on the ecosystem because they were hunter gatherers and they were also linked to the seasons. So they were hunting and gathering where they could and then they would move away from the zone, enabling any place where they had gathered and hunted to recover. This is the basic of life. And one day we, had that clever individual that um, realized or thought that um, maybe by planting a seed, observing a bird eating a seed from the same cereal, that you may actually multiply it and have tenfold more, maybe 20 fold more. So that person tried and just put the seed on the ground and then in the ground and figure out that by moving the soil, well, suddenly, this crop would grow, moving the soil as the granddad of plowing. Then as we were, those humans were obliged to settle because they had plenty of things and they wanted to see, well, they started to cut trees, build houses, and they had to stay and wait over winter for the next season to come so they could harvest. We started to put pressure on our resources, on our environment. As we go, we had more yields. So then more yields means more birth. Um, this is the same approach with any um, type of life. If you have no food, well, you have no procreation. That's the same for humans. We had more food, so we started to procreate more. And here, as we were more and we were competing with Mother Nature, same resources, well, we had to protect ourselves so that we had to cut more of those trees protect ourselves, more houses, so then also at the same time, maybe also increase um, agriculture. So getting more trees, when some were just cutting the trees, others were just cleverly trying to design their system that they once found out was absolutely spectacular. Remove the trees and then, well, remove the trunks, flatten the land, plant a lot, and we will be able, we will be able to feed more people. Well, more people, what for? Well, I don't know, maybe to have a bigger army or anything else, or because this is a natural pattern of humans growth. 
So we have here started to plow. And as plowing, more, more yields, more food, more humans. More humans, well, more pressure on the environment, more field being built, more trees being cut, et cetera, et cetera. Here you can see the settlements with animals and at the far back some agricultural fields next to a river, uh, still some trees here and there. But it, has, it didn't stay like that, obviously, as you know. Some have tried to use energy to transform their resources by water, some other used by wind, but then some, well, discovered that using charcoal and fire, we could have a way higher uh, source of energy. And it triggered some innovation such as the combustion engine. And this combustion engine feeling, fueling up another innovative pattern of industry, et cetera, it took us to log way more. That's most probably in California at uh, maybe Joshua Tree Park. Um, you can see the size of that tree. We have hardly some of those trees left today. And we have kept logging and logging and logging till we reach this kind of situation. No more trees, a lot of agricultural land, many more, a lot of production, a lot of, of excess production. So the middleman can enjoy. And in the, mean, in the meantime, the state can also have some tax about it. On that picture, what is critical is like there is very little riparian forest left, but also not even an idea of a river flowing. And that's kind of the key here, an ecosystemic disaster when, when you remove too much trees, well, you also remove the rivers. So from the first settler, cedar, going through agriculture, it took us to a way wider level, right? This level is what we see today when because of the uh, rural exodus, when most of the people have been fueling the industries and, and growing more and more, going along with higher production filled with, fueled with chemicals and et cetera, et cetera. Well, we needed machines that were capable to perform the job of asthma humans that was now working in the, in, in the industry. And still missing the point about what soil is about, right? And those guys here, the seagulls have figured it out. How of a party that was for them, you can imagine they are feasting here on earthworms uh, of course, you turn the soil and then suddenly you uncover this hidden life that they couldn't get. Um, and well, they go to a buffet. It's a free buffet and now more food and now they can reproduce themselves more, changing the ecosystem. Instead of, well, maybe having tried to stop, but we didn't understand at that time, we didn't know that there was a correlation between soil microbiology and the above ground response, which are our plants, the thing that we grow. The thing missing that we didn't see because we didn't have any microscope is all that. This is called the soil food web. It's critical, it's key here in our understanding of what we do. Um, we um, know that by plowing, we have destroyed all that. Uh, as you saw, the seagulls have very much like the earthworms. And from a very ecosystemical point of view, you can understand that if you remove one part of this ecosystem, you will change the ecosystem, which means in a certain way, you will destabilize it to a certain point where we get to some sort of idea of collapse. So that has been the beginning of agriculture and a side effect of that has been that some time in history, then because of I've been too much plowing, and I'm going to get into detail about that uh, just right after that. It obliged us to start using chemicals. And there we go. So understanding the relationship between this plowing and destroying the soil and the soil uh, life or the soil food web, um, we figured that um, this soil food web, indeed, this soil food web we found out is correlated with the above ground response within a successional approach, which means 
here we have a graph showing us uh, the multiple blocks that are corresponding at multiple stage and, and multiple type of plants growing. We can qualify what we have on the left. Um, there is nothing growing here, so it's a bare parent. There is nothing, it's a desert. And going along these gradients of succession to the far right, we can see that we have um, a change in um, what the plants are on the ground, right? So we go to the far right side of this graph where we have an old growth forest. An old growth forest, in other words, undisturbed forest, which uh, is very rare these days on planet Earth. However, looking at agriculture and what we do today, most of our agricultural systems, which means the crops that we grow for human life, are based somehow between the old growth forest on the right and the bare parent on the left. So most of our crops are here within this yellow box uh, and to a certain extent, a little bit going to the right uh, because we eat berries and fruits. So continuing on here, when we think about um, soil, structure, soil being structured by microbes. If there is no microbes, well, there is no soil structure, which means you can imagine a soil as being a block of concrete where very little can grow. And a block of concrete, you can easily figure that there is very little air flowing. No air flowing, which means no soil structure, which means um, different sets of organisms that can live in this soil condition, in anaerobic soil condition. Now we can already think about that anaerobic conditions, very poor soil structure as a consequence of plowing, but we're going to look at that a little later. On the other side, going towards this old growth forest, well, because of the evolution and the increase and the diverse in the diversity and in numbers of microbial life, we have reached aerobic condition because of the very work of this microbiology. So fungal, fungi being one of the main structuring, structurer of this soil. So we said in anaerobic environment, which means oxygen deprived environment, some microorganisms are taking over others. And here we can, we have figured, we have observed that in those anaerobic environment, usually pathogens are taking over the beneficial ones. Which, which has to be understood. This is a structural environment that enables those pathogens, viruses and pests to thrive. Without the work, without microbiology in our soil, well, we have not the condition necessary to have the beneficial microbes. Beneficial microbes struggling the soil, enabling the air to flow, enabling the root structure to go deeper, to reach more moisture, and enabling in the same time here to have these type of crops that we grow for humans, right? We mean human agricultural system. Observing now what was happening in the soil at a microbiological level, we found out main differences, main trends in terms of how much biomass we would find in terms of bacteria. So without going into details about what types of bacteria, we just figured biomass. So we have seen that on the left side, we have bacterial dominated soil, which means only bacteria. And you will understand why I say bacteria dominated just right after. And as we progress towards the soil uh, of a, a forest, going along uh, the appearance and the increase of diversity of microbial life, we have a decrease in this bacterial number 
till a certain bottom line or a plateau, a downward plateau where the number of bacteria has decreased. So why those bacteria has decreased? We're gonna look at it later. It's because of this whole food chain, the one eating the smaller, and then this is whole idea of a poop loop. So because there is predation, the big guys eat the small guys and then make the, the body of those bacteria filled with minerals plant available. So we can call poop loop somehow. But also <clears throat> we mentioned fungi has been those starting to structure our soil. And we found out as well that is, there is a difference of, bi of fungal biomass along this idea of along this idea of succession. So from the left, the bare parents towards the right side of the graph, the old growth forest. So the more we go to the old growth forest, the more we find a, a, a fungal biomass increasing to a certain degree. So keep in mind here, these numbers are indicative. They are coming from some of our measurements or our measurements and it's not a sharp, a kind of a steady, solid uh, uh, fact that we have to take, saying like, oh, for bushes and berry, you need 10,000 micrograms of fungal. No, it's, uh, it's an in-between and it's, it's an average. And what is more important that we kind of uh, came across is this idea of relationship between the fungal and the bacteria biomass within these kind of different soil system. So now, because we have two biomass for fungal and bacteria, we can now come up with this ratio and look at your soil and say, well, uh, in regard of our uh, targets, if you grow cereals, you, you, would have, you would need a system, a soil system, which is in the range of this ratio of one, for example. So that's pretty much um, the whole idea of correlating above ground response plants and soil microbiology being responsible for the soil structuring, which means creating aerobic or not creating aerobic conditions, meaning anaerobic conditions. And here we're gonna look at what it looks like in real life. These are the fungi that I was just mentioning attached to a fungal um, um, humic aggregate. I was mentioning earlier that bacteria got some predation and the one doing the predation are these guys, they are protozoans. So they are eating the bacteria which are filled with a lot of nitrogen and other minerals. And by pooping that out, the poop loop, if you prefer, they make these minerals into plant available forms. But also not only the protozoans do that, the, men, the nematodes, which are eating bacteria, they also contribute to nutrient cycling, which means eating more bacteria. Then we have the fungal feeding nematodes and we have the predatory nematodes, which are eating other nematodes. Right, so how do we get from seeding, plowing, and the depletion of the soil microbial life? Well, we're gonna take a look at that by resuming on the previous graph and understanding what happened when humans started plowing. As we said on planet Earth, before humans was a lot of disturbance such as hurricane, such as flooding, such as earthquakes and all these type of things. For the past millennium, we had some pretty okay um, conditions so humans could uh, uh, well, enjoy a life without those disturbances. However, we have been the disturbance. Interesting to consider us now has a very devastating hurricane. And how did we start to do that? By cutting the forest. Now you can see the forest has disappeared and we have started to plow. So at that time it was pulled by cows and horses and stuff like that, but we changed by some kind of deer idea, no idea, John Deere, as you like. And we started to plow. So by plowing, um, we have indeed inverted this arrow here. Um, we have sort of um, erased the advance of succession with time. 
So we took this system back by cutting the trees. And while plowing, we also have uh, had a tremendous impact on the soil microbiology. So by doing that, well, you remove, you kill all those microbial life to reach another condition, earlier condition in time in the idea of succession. So here, um, well, we believe we have found the growl. Why? Because we have seeded and then we've started to plow. And as we plowed, we have increased our yields. And increasing our yields for, for us was just an empirical understanding that plowing was the reason. So we, we had that in mind and said, sure, my dear friend, just like we should keep plowing because this is what brings the yields. And of course, and unfortunately, not having a microscope to realize that, but of, hopefully we have it today. So because of this belief that plowing was the reason of the high yield, well, we continued plowing. And an interesting thing here is to remember that as we have been canceling this successional time, this passing of time, well, we have taken our system back some very early conditions, which are called anaerobic, which means no structure in the soil, which means very little microbiology left and a whole condition ready done for pathogens. So yes, here what happened when we have plowed so much, we've reduced the microbiology and the corresponding supposedly above ground response to what should be nearly desert or dirt or bare parent. But problem was that we were we have been keeping planting the same seeds. So imagine that you have plant requiring a certain environment, but well, you don't have the corresponding microbiology. So mother nature tells you very simply, well, you are putting some of those crops in a condition which doesn't correspond to what I need. So I'm gonna send you the pests and the diseases. And this has opened the door to what we call today, fetal sanitary treatments, right? So we can discuss, if you want later, uh, whether those who have understood that there was a relationship between chemicals and plants as well, that made sure that first we didn't know, we wouldn't know about microbiology and also creating the conditions so we would enable those products to be working. But most probably they worked in coexistence with the microbiology to start, but then as of today, we all know what are the results. Farmers needs more chemical, prices are higher, and the consequences on human health and any other living being around us is dramatic, right? So that's why we do what we do, that's the background. Now, a little bit, a bit more details about what happens in terms of minerals when we are in aerobic or anaerobic conditions. When you look at the main, some of the main minerals, such as nitrogen, sulfur, and, and, and phosphates, well, in aerobic conditions, these minerals are said to remain plant available, right? Because of the, the possibility of the microbiology to chew on them, that remains in the poop loop, as we said, and so it becomes still plant available. However, now in anaerobic conditions, which means oxygen deprived conditions, those minerals are transformed in something else. And most of those new forms of minerals are gases. And guess what? Plants are not equipped to uh, capture these types of gases. What they need is the oxidized or aerobic form of those minerals. Adding up on that, other little nasty product that are created under anaerobic condition is those acids, smelling like rancid, maybe vomit or decaying flesh. You know, when you smell that, that it's something is going wrong, at least when it's too much. And also alcohols, formaldehyde and old phenols. You know that plants cannot grow on alcoholic um, environments. Continuing on, um, the key then is, well, you want to have a fully functioning 
um, enabling uh, diversity of life uh, under and above ground, you need to keep your soil aerobic. Um, if you have been plowing for decades, you must probably have compaction problem and, and hard pants and stuff like that. But after you do take care of that, you have to bring the missing biology very quick. Because if you don't, well, obviously you can think about the succession graph that we talked about earlier. Mother Nature took her time in terms of uh, bringing the succession up and the evolution up. So yes, these one are the microbes that I looked in my microscope and I know when I see them that your system is fully healthy and functional. Um, to a certain degree, of course, we have to adjust, uh, depends on your context and what we see and how much we see. Those are absolutely beneficial, yes. And as we said, they thrive in oxygen-rich environments. They build and maintain the soil structure, allowing air and water to flow. On the other way around, well, anaerobic microbes are detrimental to your crops. You remember again, this graph that we watched or in anaerobic environment, you have a set of pathogens. And usually this is what you see. This is the kind of microbiology that when I look in my microscope and your soil is about that, well, I can tell you that you'd rather start or stop doing what you do and consider bringing um, beneficial microbiology or any kind of remediating um, action that we can uh, we can suggest. So yes, these are detrimentals and they are completely the opposite of the other ones, which means no oxygen and also disease causing, mostly when you want to grow the crops that are not supposed in those conditions. That's what we learned from the previous graph. Now, uh, entering more into the core of the subject for about our trial here, we're going to just cover quickly what has been, um, what we have been applying and how we did that. I mean, what was the methodology? Because we want to understand uh, how we do things so we understand what means, what the results that we have means. So um, these are the results again. And um, the most important part here, actually, besides the fact that we had spectacular results, on the first uh, growing season um, is about what we tried. So the farmers here um, had some, they were organic, but they had pest and disease problem, of course, because too much plowing in the previous years. So we um, have produced um, a program where we would just enable mother nature to function fully, which means keep the pathogen down, um, increase the nutrient cycling for our plants without having to bring some chemicals, but also build soil structure, enabling water to flow. And, and indeed, also the bonus part here was to reduce the weeds. So how come this soil food web is, is, has helped us? Let, let's look at that. We have assessed how much of the soil food was in their soil. Of course, was plowed for many years, most probably a lot of chemicals. We didn't know about the field history. However, uh, we, we then had a, a beautiful compost loaded with beautiful microbiology, the whole microbiology that we need, because guess what? This is our job. So we produce the compost that is needed for regeneration. Then we uh, extracted this microbiology with those compost tea brewers, extracted the microbiology, in the water and then multiplied it and then brought it back to the soil. We then compared the scenarios and then we could prove that the biodiverse microbial life is the key of any organic system. Right. So the two sides of the coin here is of course yields and weeds. You understood it. You can speak to any farmer. This is what he's gonna tell you. It's about weeds because there is the idea that weeds is competing with your actual crops, which is partly right, because if your soil is within those conditions uh, which are early successional, which means weeds or uh, worse than weeds in anaerobic conditions, of course, your crops are struggling against those weeds because the conditions in the soil are made for weeds. So we have to change those conditions. And this is what we do by bringing this microbiology. And this is what we're going to prove and show you now. 
So the experiment on the yield itself was just starting about the control, as you understood, they, what was happening in their context, which means they were already organic, um, but without any amendment. So they had pest and disease problem, as you understood. And they bought some commercial compost, thinking that it would help. And it did. However, the quality of the compost was not, if it was a commercial compost, we had no idea how it was produced with what diversity of resources. And when I looked in the microscope, of course, there was none of the life or very little of the life that we were needed. So we had to create another scenario where we would bring some uh, microbial inoculation coming from our compost on the top of the existing commercial compost that would adjust, microbiologically speaking, um, the soil conditions. And so we would compare um, the yields between original, normal context, nothing. What would a commercial compost with very little of beneficial life would produce as yield? And then see if, whether or not, the microbiology would just do uh, an actual effect, uh, an actual consequence, positive in terms of yield. Now, on the wheat pressure, we tried quite the same thing. So we started by the same control, but we decided instead as well to do um, a scenario where we would just put the microbiology on its own. So control, and then the same control with the microbiology. Does that make a difference with wheat? We're going to look at that. <clears throat> Then we replicated the same scenario that we had on the yields. And um, we then decided to explore how much wheat we would have only with the com commercial compost. So that was the, what the plot looked like. As you can see on the left, this is the early stage of remediation. We have actually remediated the whole plot, the whole one hectare, and we just kept a few stripes, a few rows of um, uh, vegetables where we would have designed the side scenarios that um, we just explored, that we just presented. The right side is what it looked like in the middle of the season. Talking about results, here we go. The key element here is the following. No, only compost, not any type of compost is not beneficial for your crops. This result shows you. I checked it, we checked it microbiologically, we knew it, but we want to understand here that if you have a, a already depleted soil and you bring on the top of it something which is not beneficial or something that is not microbiologically adjusted, you will continue fueling the current system that you have, which means most probably coming from an anaerobic condition with very old yield and pests, you will, we will continue to have that. And that was those farmers have that. Here you can see scenario one and two, which are um, the column on the left, the blue and beige columns, uh, which are compared in the very right column on the pink color. You can see that most of the results are showing a decrease of yield which means that, well, this compost has actually um, produced the opposite, right? So how good or how bad this compost was? Well, we can say, but the good point is that because we brought this missing biology that we've explored previously, we could then reach absolutely fantastic results. You can see the average again, 72%, and if you just take a few, of those examples, you can take celery or you can take um, kale. You can see that we reach over 100% of e yield increase. You may tell me, yes, the original yield was very low, most probably, but this is the same. This is the same approach with chemical agriculture. Remove the chemicals, you will have no yield. So then we have to replenish this soil with what is the initial fertilizing, crop protection, um, which is soil microbiology. So now talking about the weed results, um, the two, you remember the four scenarios, uh, the control scenario one and two, when scenario two is just the control, um, we figured that 
um, our microbiological ap application, inoculation, would actually make a decrease of 38% of weeds. How did we do that? We planted our crops, we didn't weed the whole season, while we had applied on the, on the, the scenario with microbiology, we just put what we needed to put, and we just harvested all the weeds just before harvest, and then we had weighed it green. Um, the good thing here is that when we watched um, what the compost uh, only has done compared to compost and composted microbiology also confirms that microbiology has a dramatic reduction effect on weeds. And this can be explained scientifically. We're now exploring understanding why, but this is not the topic as of today. I want to bring another thing here, which is also very interesting about the quality of the compost when it doesn't have um, microbiology in it. You can compare scenario four, the green box on the right, and scenario two, the control. You can see that without the microbiology, the compost makes your system produce more weeds, right? So that says that, well, double check if you can, the quality of your compost or make sure you make it well. And on that, we can uh, support you and as we've been supporting those farmers. Uh, and this is also what we're doing now at large scale. So entering the core of the results, we're gonna have a look now at some pictures about the difference of yields. Now we're talking about kale, an average of 126% increase when we have Absolutely, we have adjusted the microbiology on the top of the existing compost, which we saw was not so beneficial to start with. Um, look at the height. You have on the left side of or the right side of the pictures, you have this tape measure. It shows us a scale. There is no photoshopping here. Um, you can see that already on the size, you're at least um, nearly, nearly. 70% higher, but more importantly is about the edible, edible weight. Height, it doesn't matter here because we're talking about how much the farmer can sell. So we talk about edible weight. Edible weight from um, the actual microbiological adjustment and the control scenario is nearly threefold. But remember, it's not, these are individual plants. They are not completely corresponding to the average increase, which is taking the overall plot scenario weighing and measuring. Another part confirming that co good compost is not mainstream is the right side of the pictures here, the third picture on the right. Um, well, just with commercial compost, you have a smaller plant and you have less edible weights. Continuing on here, um, celery, um, very interesting fact here on the rhizosphere and most precisely the hair rooting that we can see on the left side compared to the central picture, which is the control. Um, the root biomass is actually uh, twice as much as um, the micro, well, uh, twice, twice as much compared to the control scenario. And this is the same story with the edible weight, uh, the total weight, the total number of stems, and et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Another, another one here showing that commercial compost indeed has been inhibiting the growth of those, uh, of those vegetables, which you don't want when you're organic because you have to make some cash at the end of the day. Same with fennel. Um, same, I can repeat here, 58% increase in average. Um, on the left, very healthy looking plant, very green and white. On the right side, you see the compost has made this plant looking like kind of sick, which is a little uh, kind of similar with the control, which is kind of an in-between between both. Onions, we have worked it, but harvested too early. However, a 12% increase at that stage of growth was correct. Um, we still see a higher um, height here for most for our um, 
microbiology version. Um, and again, the compost is showing the opposite. The, the commercial compost is showing the other way around. So not the good microbiology. Well, well, good luck with your crops, good luck with your yields, good luck with your disease. Now, potatoes, same, same. Here, some of you may say, these are not the same variety. That's right. Uh, that's a mistake. However, to our defense, I can say that those potatoes varieties are high yielding. And the fact that we found out is that the average unit is way higher with the microbiology. So that means that the soil structure is way looser and the nutrients available are way better. And at the end of the day, within this limit, this, this, this trial with potato, 42% um, of increase is still good. So it was the same with rutabaga, it was the same with salads and lettuces. Um, yes, Swiss chards, same approach, way more edible weight, etc., uh, etc., etc. Et the only detail here is the only time when commercial compost here has indeed made um, the um, yield better than the control, but that's only one on eight crops. So what are, that proves well it proves that microbiology is key in regenerating the soil um it's key for yields it's key for uh, crop protection and optimal nutrient cycling it also provides a pretty simple um and straightforward um, framework uh, let's say and operational methodology so we can actually remediate our soils at any scale because now i'm doing it large scale sure we have some challenges but it's work and i'm not the only one doing it so yeah um microbiology is key there is no doubt um we have to take into account that if we want to restore things we have to bring that back into our soils and um yes the key is soil health is soil microbiology so continuing on here um yeah we want to thank dr elaine ingham for her pioneer work um has inspired me and many others so much in taking action into the soil regeneration uh, challenge that we are facing um if you want to learn more about the theory about all that and you want to get trained on how to do that, um, you should contact uh, the Soil Food Web School. And now uh, if you are a farmer or you need some hands-on or some actual regeneration program um, at any scale or at community level, you feel free to contact me and I will be happy to guide you. So that's it. I wish you a very, very pleasant um, end of Soils Generation Summit, the first one. And hopefully it will inspire a lot of you. Uh, and uh, I speak to you later at the Q&A session. Thank you. Bye bye.